try that again here. There we go. So welcome everybody to our open hearted practice group where it's Monday, March 21st, 3.30. Happy spring. If you're here in the Northern Hemisphere, I don't see anybody here from New, e New Zealand or Australia at the moment, but happy fall if you are here and listening to the recording. So it's the shift of seasons today or yesterday, depending on which calendar you look at. And uh, so i um, glad you're here. Yeah, and I see so many more people coming in as we go. Welcome to all of you. It's a delight to see your faces, um, those of you who are willing to be seen, and just the sense of partnership that you're here, that you share the same values around everybody's needs mattering and wanting to create a world where there's collaboration and less conflict. And that's especially really dear at this time in our lives. And uh, it actually brings tears to my eyes to realize I have all these partners in wanting to find ways to meet more needs at less cost to other needs and other people. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, I'm touched that you're here. And um, I'm, I've just been touched in general. I mean, just tender. I think the word is really tender for the last uh, little over three weeks since the conflict in Europe uh, became so violent. And um, it just, it, it really um, emphasizes the importance of things like nonviolent communication to support people in navigating conflict in a way that um, is healthier for everybody, including the planet, than war. And um, that's the, the name of our class today is Transforming Conflict. And uh, Jory and I decided uh, when we were planning the class today that we would do this over the next two weeks. There's just too much to uh, try to do in one day. Uh, there's, we, we can actually teach this for the rest of the year, the Transforming Conflict part. Um, but this is this is where we uh, really move into the application of all those other skills that we've been working on for the last uh, since October when we started this series. So it's a chance um, doesn't mean you have to have been here, by the way, for the whole series. Um, every class stands alone. But for those of you who have been working with NVC for a while, this is a chance to really start utilizing and combining all the skills in a creative way in transforming conflict. If you're here for the first time, we're really glad that you found us. I'm always amazed that new people find us. I don't know how we don't do any advertising, uh, and uh, but it's always a, a, a very sweet miracle when I get to meet somebody new here. And so if you are here for the first time, let me just explain a little bit about what we do and how we do it. Uh, we practice what are called the three modes of nonviolent communication in this group. And those three modes are self-connection, where we're using, using nonviolent communication uh, as a way to connect more deeply with ourselves. And then there's the empathy part, which is the listening part of nonviolent communication. And then there's the honesty part where we're expressing the life that's moving in us. So we'll have a chance to practice all three of those today at various times. And we do it in a, a variety of ways. We'll start in a moment with kind of like a contemplation or a meditation, a moment where you can just be with yourself and then um, we'll shift from that and Jory will be making small groups for us. And small groups just means a chance for you to practice the honesty and empathy and self-connection skills all at one time with, uh, with, with people in a small group, usually three, sometimes four. And then we'll come back from that and continue the rest of the class, which will include a little lesson on transforming conflict, more practice, and so forth, back and forth. So we try to keep this very interactive and um, and lots of a chance for you to, to speak and be heard as well. So let's start with a little self-connection exercise, unless there's something up for somebody that somebody else wants to say first. Um, I want to ask Corey to send you the, the message she sent to me because I don't know how to answer it. OK. All right, so self-connection. Yeah. 
Okay, oh, you're done, Joy. You, is there more? No, that's I just I, since I mentioned it to everyone, it's about helping her connect. Okay. Just to fill in that blank. Well, that's what we're all about is helping people to connect, right? <laughs> yes. All right. So let's go ahead and um, for this exercise, um, we will practice some skills that will help us to be more present when conflict emerges. And the first skill we've done before, uh, if you've been to this group before, and it's actually my go-to strategy for settling down my nervous system. And it's so simple. It uses the two main skills of the, of the matrix, uh, presence and observing. And so uh, just start by setting your intention. Why do you wanna do this exercise? Answer that question for yourself. Why, why would you wanna do, come to this class or do this exercise? And then to support you coming fully into the present moment, I invite you to just let your eyes go wherever they want to go. Just look around, in other words. So usually we direct where our eyes go. And in this case, just going to relax that willpower. And instead, let your eyes go wherever they want to go. And then as you look around, see if you can notice five specific things as you look around. And then when you're finished with that, you can let your eyes close if you want to close your eyes. And listen. Again, just listen to the sounds in your environment. And as you listen, see if you can notice and name four specific sounds. And then shifting again to another channel, the channel of texture or touch. Just notice how your skin, especially your hands, your fingertips, your feet, the bottom of your feet, your toes, just notice how they, the life, the energy, You might already be aware of how you're touching the environment without even trying. And then with your dominant hand, notice and name three specific things that you can touch and do it in a mindful way. Just letting yourself enjoy the sense of touch. And then notice that you also have a sense of smell. And see if you can notice and name two specific aromas or odors. It's okay if you have to move your body to do that.
and then notice one taste. Either taste something with intention or just notice the taste that's already present in your mouth. And then shifting to your sensations in your body. Just let your consciousness move through your body, noticing sensations. They could be pleasant sensations that you enjoy feeling, or they could be unpleasant sensations like uh, pain or pressure that you don't like. And with the next breath, shift your attention to your needs. What needs are you aware of right now? What's important to you? I'll make a couple of guesses based on previous experience, what I've heard from people, why they might be here. Maybe you're interested in learning or personal growth or fun, community, connection. Something else. If you don't know what you need, then maybe that's the need for clarity. And then shifting one last time to what would make your life more wonderful for the next couple of hours as we hang out together and learn NBC? What requests do you have of yourself first In other words, what can you do to increase the likelihood of getting the needs met that brought you here? And maybe there's a request alive in you concerning somebody else. So first, see if you can find any requests like that. And if you do, then maybe take a moment to write them down so that you can get back to them later. If your eyes have been closed, you can open them when you're ready. And we'll finish the way we started by just looking around. Making sure you're in a safe place. And if you are, just enjoy that right now you're safe. And if you're not, then go somewhere else where you can be safe. And just notice how your body is now. Maybe you have a recollection of how, how it was when you started the exercise and maybe there's some shift that you noticed. Maybe not, it's okay either way. And we'll start transitioning now to small groups. Jory's been working in the background to make small groups of three and she's going to set the timer for nine minutes 
And what that means is in the upper right hand corner of your screen, if you'll see a countdown timer that will start at uh, 8.59 as soon as we open the groups. And it'll count down to zero, but then there'll be two extra minutes afterwards. You don't have to do anything to come back. You can just relax and and you'll automatically come back here after those two additional minutes. And the reason we add those two extra minutes is because sometimes it takes Jory a few minutes to get these groups settled because people arrive um, and leave and so forth. So it just takes a couple of minutes to get the groups adjusted. And we'll be back here in 11 minutes. Okay, and there are some people who came in and everybody, everybody's coming back. Zoom, I know why they call it Zoom. It always catches me when this happens. Yeah. So if you, so if you are not unmuted, I mean, if you are unmuted, go ahead and mute yourself. And I would love to just hear from anyone who would like to share how their breakout is or any requests or, or questions about anything we've covered today or previously. You can just unmute yourself and let us know. Or raise your hand which if you don't know how to raise your hand, there's a little thing on the bottom of the screen that says reactions. And then if you click on that little button, it can raise your hand like Rena just did. Good morning, Rena. Perfect, and Marie, you demonstrated it. Go ahead, Rena. Good morning, good morning, evening, afternoon. Oh my God, this breakout room was magical because one, there was such sense of belonging across Toronto, Tokyo, and Dharamshala. <laughs> and, um, and also such gratitude for both of you, Jory and Jim, and what you bring to being in your presence was like, which we resonated with is, you know, brings hope and brings to me a sense that I matter. And my need was uh, for trust and, you know, trust in community. You know, in, so yeah, because that's so important in the certification journey. You know, so that's what I could I could celebrate and, and savor. Because there is a longing and also savoring, and being held in this space just fills me up. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank mahalo. You. Yeah, mahalo, mahalo. Yeah. yeah. And then Rob? Yeah, we just, uh, one uh, member of the breakout room uh, just guessed a need to be heard for me. And I was like, yeah, need to be heard and a matter. And then later on, she admitted that's what she really needed to be heard. And uh, so it's just very nur uh, nurturing uh, in the breakout room and uh, thankful for that. Nice. Thank you. And then Patricia, thank you. There you are. I recognize you. <laughs> Can't hear you yet, Patricia. I, I there said you that, go. Um, something funny happened in the group, and I just wanted to share because it was so cute. It was really funny. Somebody said, um because of their you know lack of knowing what to do after covid how to communicate and they said something about oh how they would like to have some some person meet some person who knew how to do nvc and knew how to communicate and i happened to say oh the only place you're going to find that is to borrow jim <laughs> the person said i don't think jory's gonna like that <laughs> Yeah, one can only hope there are more resources. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was hysterical. I don't know. Maybe she would like it depending on the rental amount. Maybe. I don't know. Well, maybe I just need a, a, a special word, though, to make sure he remembers when he talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, nothing like a good laugh. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> you. 
Anything else before we go to Janet? Nope, I no. guess. And for you, Janet? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that the last week I was in a breakout group with Dawn and I'm forgetting the name of the lady that's often there with Dawn. Dawn, if you hear me, you could tell me her name because I'd like to know her name. But anyway, you were talking about this book, The Book of Hope by Jane Goodall. And I've been listening to this audio book and I just want to say I'm enjoying it so much and it is actually giving me hope. So mm. thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then that's that's me. I'm Beth, and we read that book together. And now oh. I have an audio copy of it. Oh, Beth, thank yes. you so much. That was such a great thing to find out about. Yeah. I, I love it. Wave your hand, Beth. Where are you? Oh, Beth. Oh, could I, could I also say that if you go to YouTube and you type in Jane Goodall, she has a ton of videos, and she reads a book that she wrote. So yeah, she's she's awesome. Yeah, the voice from the past for me. Thank you. Oh, no, it's future. I mean, right now, present. Oh, I know. I know. But it, it, she's a voice from the past for me. I haven't listened to her lately. Oh, okay. it should. Mm -hmm. And Nikhil Ananda. Yeah, it always takes me a bit to get it unmuted. Uh, this is for Jim and Jory. Uh, I went by a mutual friend's house finally after three months and haven't seen her for 20 years. So uh, thank you guys. And also just before the group, I got an email this morning from uh, Alexandra, who's still fine. Uh, however, all of her family is still in Ukraine and also um, the, now it's 3.30 in the morning where she is, so um, she's not unable to attend. She mentioned that to me. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you and everybody in the group, but uh, especially Jim and Jory, <laughs> thank you for uh, this. It's been a long time coming. I'm glad you got it, Nikki Lananda. <laughs> All right. So uh, I got a couple of messages during the uh, <clears throat> during the breakout group. What are we supposed to do in the breakout room? Because I didn't really give you in any instructions today, and I wish you could. I wish I could say that that was like a real clever move as as a being a trainer that I did that on purpose, but I didn't. <laughs> I just forgot to tell you. And uh, but uh, I'll go with uh, that Marshall Rosenberg's advice. Most of you know that Marshall is the founder of nonviolent communication, and. Um, Somebody uh, once asked Marshall something like, uh, what's the purpose of human life? And Marshall says, the purpose of human life is to hang out. And so that's really all what we're doing here is hanging out with each other. And when you go to small groups, uh, that's the general idea is we're hanging out with each other and um, connecting. And so if all you do is went into the group and looked at each other and tried to figure out what Jim wanted you to do, Jim and Jory wanted you to do, that's connecting and hanging out. And I love that some people asked, made a request, and I went and visited those groups and gave some suggestions of what you could be doing. So anyway, I wanted to just be transparent about my error today and not, not giving you guidance. So, wow, I, I looked at the clock, you know, and I'm still used to the old time. And I say 4.05, well, we don't even start for 10 more minutes. We're really early today, but I know we, we, we made this choice to uh, start an hour earlier for some of, for us anyway. For some of you, it's exactly the same time that we've always started. And um, I, I mourned, I got an email from uh, someone today that uh, often comes to this group and it really has had an impact on her. And I just heard that it had an impact on Alexandra as well. And, so it just brings to mind that there's no such thing as a perfect strategy. And for those of you who weren't a part of the process, we did a little voting poll to find out what time people wanted to start with the, with the change to daylight savings time. And the, and, the reality, and, and the reality is it was going to change for some people either way. We either kept it the same for us or we tried to make it choose something that hopefully would work for everybody. So I do feel some regret for those who this is more difficult and miss them too. Yeah. And I welcome them all at the same time. Yeah. It just reminds me that <clears throat> that's one of the, per that one of the reasons we have conflict 
all conflict is at the level of strategy. And so as we dive into the lesson today about transforming conflict, keep that in mind that all, if you only had one takeaway from today, that would be a good one, that all, con all the conflict in your life is at the level of strategy. And uh, the one step towards the resolution of conflict is to connect, to connect at the level of needs. And by letting go temporarily of the strategy and moving towards connection to the needs, uh, the idea is that we can discover a new way that uh, a new strategy that might um, more effectively attend to everybody getting their needs satisfied. And it doesn't even have to be the first try. We might try uh, once and try again and try again. And um, one last thing about the time shift. <clears throat> and I don't think we've ever been explicit about this, so I want to be explicit that if, if it doesn't work for you to come on, on time at the time that we have agreed to start, that's fine. Even if you came a half hour late, so to speak, there's no such thing as late. If you came a half hour after the scheduled start time or an hour after the scheduled start time or one hour and 59 minutes after the scheduled start time, that's okay with me. I just love that you come and visit and hang out, even if it's for just one minute at the end and then the after party when people get yeah, to just for clarity you are welcome here and you can come and go as you please <clears throat> and i do regret any impact that has been made through this whole process of living in the, a country where most of the people lose change their time <clears throat> and uh we're doing the best we can to try and meet as many needs as we can. And sometimes we can't. Thanks, Troy. You know, uh, just I got a little distracted and because Monaco put something in the chat um, that her Internet's not working very well because they recently had a, an earthquake in, in near where she lives in Japan. Of course, wow. Japan has lots of earthquakes and but they did have one about a week ago that was pretty severe. Uh, 7.3, I think, on the scale. So uh, my heart goes out to all of our friends in Japan uh, who are re recovering from that. So <clears throat> moving on to our class. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And I, I love this image um, that uh, came from our friend Kenneth Enright, who made uh, this uh, deck of cards about the 28 skills that we've been studying. And um, as a cat owner my whole life, uh, this is a very familiar scene. And, um, <laughs> and I'm pretty confident that conflict's never gonna go away for any of us, even though it may be a, a dream that we all have. But rather what we can do instead is to begin to use conflict as a way to connect and then to hopefully, like I said a minute ago, to um, to move towards a more mutual outcome. And so um, for those of you who uh, have been here before, you know, we're we're navigating through these 28 skills that Jory and I, along with Jake Gottwalls and Jack Lehman, created a few years ago called the Pathways to Liberation Matrix of Self-Assessment. And so I think today we're on about the 22nd skill, 21st or 22nd skill. <clears throat> so we've been going at this since October. And uh, today's uh, lesson is called Transforming Conflict. And you can see that uh, like all of the skills, there's a pathway uh, from a time when maybe you never even thought about conflict. Uh, maybe you were scared of it and so forth. And then you kind of go through this uh, progressive process of becoming more and more able to um, work with conflict as it arises in your life. And that's what we're going to be working on for the next two weeks is gaining some skills and highlighting the skills that you've already been learning uh, to figure out, uh, help you figure out how to transform the conflict into connection. And from there to get really creative, to awaken your creativity and to uh, find ways to get uh, everybody's needs met. So Ezra, you have a question? Hi, Jim. Good evening. Yes, I do. Um, do you guys ever restart the matrix? Because I caught you guys 
I think towards the end of it. Yeah, we, we go over it and over it and over it again. And <clears throat> everything we do um, is kind of, at least everything I do is somehow related to the matrix. So I try to point out the skills. <clears throat> and of course, all the recordings from previous calls are available. And we'll give you that link at the end of the call. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, so since we're, we're moving into potentially um, risky territory talking about conflict, <clears throat> I want to say a little bit of a little bit about levels of intensity. Because in a minute I'm going to invite you to think about a conflict that you've either been a part of or witnessed and uh, people have a tendency to um, kind of go for the PhD level right off the bat and uh, work on the thing that you've been in therapy about for the last 10 years or whatever and the suggestion is that you don't do that that you pick a teeny tiny conflict uh, maybe even a conflict that you have with yourself or maybe a, a conflict that you have with your pet it doesn't even matter uh, I, it was a little bit of a joke about a pet but um, uh, find a conflict that's at a relatively low level of intensity but that it's intense enough to awaken some sense of what it's like to be in a conflict, but not something that's um, a, a tsunami of emotion that's that washes you away and floods you. So uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? Why don't you think about uh, probably already you're thinking of different conflicts that you've had in your life, but pick one and um, uh, write down the observation of what happened. And then in a moment, I'm going to give you um, some guidance on how to clarify the observation. So I'll be quiet for a minute or two while you think of a conflict that you've been in or witnessed and then write down what you saw and heard just in a very brief way. <clears throat> the temptation for most of us when you're confronted with a question like this is to get um, evaluative. And what I mean by that is like, uh, you, I, I, I could just see, see myself writing something down that says something like, um, I'm always fighting with my fill in the blank, my kid, my wife, my parents, my coworkers. And what we're looking for is more specificity so that you can have more clarity about the conflicts that we work on. So you might express the conflict like this. A wants blank. B wants blank. So imagining that one person is A, maybe that's you, you're A, and B is the other person involved in the conflict. So what do you want? And then how is that different than what the other person wants? I'll give you a common one in relationships. Um, a wants to process a conflict, talk about what happened and try to work it out. B wants to forget about it and just move on. If anybody wants to put examples uh, in the chat, 
of these conflicts that might stimulate creativity for other people. But not required. I'll just be quiet for about 30 more seconds because I noticed some people are still writing. Go ahead, Jeanette. Okay, my question, when there is conflict, isn't it about usually control, no matter what the issue is? Um, well, I suppose that would be one way of framing it. Uh, I would say uh, that uh, the way that I might frame it is uh, A and B have two different preferences, and they just haven't figured out a way yet to get everybody's needs met. Mm. And uh, so it gets it can, it can get the conflict can get in more intense if one person tries to use power over the other. And um, you don't have to go too far into the newspaper to see how that works out. Uh, how when we have power over um, people, then it can have pretty tragic consequences. Mm hmm. That would be an example. Control would be um, what happens when one person tries to exert power over another. Does that, does that okay. clarify it for you, Jeanette? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if, well, anyway, yes. Thank you for answering. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so I think everybody's probably got a conflict now, and maybe you've got a whole list of them. That's cool. <clears throat> but we're only going to use one at a time. So now you do a, a, a brief kind of memory experience <clears throat> for yourself. So you, you bring this conflict to mind and then notice what, what do you wanna do? What, what, do what, what, what does your body wanna do in the presence of the conflict? So notice the urge that comes up in your body when this conflict erupts in front of you. And write down a description of what your body wants to do. Describe, describe what it's like in your body to yourself. You notice sensations that come up. That'll give you some clues about how you can transform the conflict. So I'm thinking of a conflict I recently had and um, I, I, um, my initial reaction was to kind of shut down. I kind of went dead it's hard to even notice that i had a body in that particular moment I kind of felt numb And then just look around again, go back to orientation 
exercise that we started with and just look around, let the conflict go for a second. So now we can kind of go to our left brain and just talk about these reactions from more of an observing place. And so one thing that I'm going to just talk about four different uh, reactive patterns. These may be there, maybe there's more than four, but just for the purposes of today, these are the four that we'll be talking about. And so the first one is freezing. And that's what I did. It was like, I didn't know what to do. This was very familiar. I've, I've seen this car coming at me before, but I was frozen and paralyzed, just like that deer. That's exactly how I felt. And I was, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to be invisible. So that's number one. Number two, fleeing, run away, right? There, when, when that's the reactive pattern that awakens in your experience, often you notice a lot of energy in your legs. Your heart rate will increase and uh, your legs become energized. And um, whereas in that first one, freezing, heart rate decreases and you actually kind of go into a temporary hibernation state. You, you, your brain disconnects from, from your body and your, the prefrontal for cortex, this big thinking part of our brain kind of shuts down. And uh, we try to become a little in, as invisible as possible. Not like this is a conscious thing that we're doing. It's just what reactively happens. Whereas here, uh, in order to um, move away from the perceived threat, we energize our legs, our heart rate increases, blood pressure goes up, all those things that you associate with flight. The third choice is posturing. I found this picture on the internet today when I was making these slides, and I absolutely love this picture of, a, of, a, of some kind of a, a deer or a buck that's got a lot of antlers and he is, um, I just can hear his voice bellowing. And just imagine that you're confronting this dude. He suddenly looks bigger than the Empire State Building. And uh, we posture to others lots of different ways. Um, even before we get into a conflict, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we might, uh, when we're going to a meeting with uh, somebody, we might dress extra fancy to kind of, um, show our status. Uh, we might um, uh, talk in a louder voice. Uh, we might puff up our chest uh, and so forth. And so the idea of that is to, um, again, it's not like a rational thought that we're doing. It's just something that has worked for, for human beings and other animals for the last millions of years in order to, to, to protect ourselves. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, the idea here yeah, that, that our body hopes is that the other person will go into freeze or flee. That's why we posture. And of course, the last um, choice is fighting. So here, the idea is to disable or kill the threat or somehow trigger submission in the other person. I say it's a last resort. It may not be your last resort. In fact, I want to find out. I'm going to stop sharing. Probably don't need to talk too much about fight. I will just say this, <clears throat> that this is similar to fleeing in that uh, your heart rate is likely to increase, blood pressure increases, you and, and, and you, you go temporarily deaf. Once your heart rate goes above about 100 beats per minute, for most people, you go temporarily deaf. You can't hear what the other person is saying. That's why fights seem to escalate because no, like, like my mentor, Krista Morph, certified trainer since 1989, she says it's two deaf people fighting. It's always two deaf people fighting. <clears throat> and now there's physiological evidence that this is actually uh, not a metaphor, it's true. We go temporarily stone deaf, we can't hear each other. So I'll stop there and I'd love to find out uh, with let's let's play with some hand raising. If you if you wrote down that your reactive pattern in your conflict was to freeze, raise your hand. 
Let's just see how many people are freezers like me. <coughs> yeah, you can raise your hand either way. It's great to do the reactions. <coughs> mm -hmm. So look, we're not alone. A lot of us freeze. And we freeze in conflict because of our trauma history. You know, we found out that freezing it's true for me, I can only talk for myself. I found out at the body level that freezing was the safest thing for me to do. So go ahead and put your hand down again by pushing the button again. This is fun, never done this before. And so now if you were a fleer, if you like to flee in your, in, in your particular conflict, let's, um, let's raise your hand now. If you notice your reactive pattern is to flee. Yeah, about the same number. So again, none of us are alone in any of these reactive patterns. Go ahead and put your hand back down again. Now the, the next choice <clears throat> might be a, a choice that you, you don't know about. As, uh, when I first learned about this, it was like, it just clarified things tremendously about um, my own behavior in certain conflicts. If you find out that you're a person who postures trying to puff yourself up, but you really hope that the other person doesn't fight, that they instead back down, raise your hand if you're a posturer. Yeah. You raise your voice, but you really have no intention of fighting, puff up your chest and so forth. Yeah few less people but now you've got something new you can try feel free to try posturing next time might be fun just kidding um let's see here and then the last one if you notice your tendency is to fight either with your words or your body raise your hand <clears throat> remember the intention of fighting is to disable kill or cause your opponent to uh, submit so it's uh it, it's a much rarer choice but it's in us i i notice it comes up for me especially when the other the other um options don't seem to work great so go ahead and put your hands back down unless you have a question so we'll just pause here and see if there's any questions or comments Ada, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a comment. Okay, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Ezra. Go ahead, Ezra. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to add, for me, posturing is either <clears throat> matching the situation, like whoever is across from me, kind of matching up where they're at. So I don't come across as either too naive or too strong. Naive might not be the right word, but you know, someone that could be taken advantage of. Or I either posturize in a way of, I'm just trying to get through this conflict. I'm just trying to get this, like, I just want this to be done. And I'm kind of like forcefully rushing through the process instead of actually understanding where their needs and my needs are coming from makes sense to me. That sounds, that sounds very resonant. I see a lot of other hand, heads nodding. This is uh, not unfamiliar to a lot of us. Go ahead, Nikki Lananda, and then Tanya. Go ahead, Nikki Lananda. So the conflict I chose, I looked at the fighting, fleeing, posturing, and, and I understand, I feel, all four, and a fifth one came up to me, resignation, acceptance, because none of them fit in the, uh, in the specific conflict that I happened to choose. Yeah. And I just found that I kept on toying with it and uh, I gave up and it was resignation is the only thing that came up. The other four just didn't fit. So yeah. I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Maybe have some insight. Yeah, I don't know about any insight, but I, re I resonate with it. I, I would call it a submission. And um, I think it's related. It's a little bit of a blend 
of um, uh, of, um, of freezing and fleeing uh, for me. It's kind of a combination energy, but it's just like you know, like in that in that first picture of the cats. Uh, you know, one cat's like this, and the other cat's like that, and that's the the posture of domination on the top and submission on the bottom, and that's that's pretty much summarizes a lot of the human condition, I think. And can we find another way? I hope so. I hope so. Tanya? Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this fight, flight, freeze, submit kind of stuff. And uh, actually what works for me is something different, which comes from social style, which is, uh, so you kind of go through, there's like four positions and that shows how what they call a Z pattern, which is you actually go from one to the other to the other as you get more stressed in the situation. And <clears throat> because uh, I would, I pick posturing, but for me, posturing also often comes across not as uh, like the bull moose or anything, but more like um, I'm calm and I know what everyone needs to do. And, um, you know, I, I literally controlled a, a, a crowd of <clears throat> over a thousand people with one other person by posturing in that way. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and also it comes from my upbringing, I have a very large father who had PTSD and it was me standing up to him with assurance that with the sense of assurance that I'm in control that got him to not be violent with my family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you learn wow. deeply. Yeah. 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 And you're kind of pointing to the, and we're going to get there in just a minute, where you're kind of pointing to the way out that each of these reactive patterns has built within it a transformational possibility. And you were able to uh, transform the energy of posturing into leadership. Leadership in the service of peace, sounds like. Uh, Rob? Yeah, hopefully mine's a, a similar, uh, oh, I lost my notes there. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I was just at the dog park and uh, a guy came in, a homeless person with a, uh, a very aggressive dog. Everybody was uh, fighting to get, you know, or, or jockeying to get out of the dog park as soon as possible. I see I couldn't get out. So I was very, you know, I was sweating. I, and I, 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 I saw I just had to submit to the situation. I felt trapped. But then I was able to just kind of relax myself a little bit. And I said hi to the guy, how he was doing. And he said, oh, God, thank you for recognizing me. And so we had some connection. And but uh, it was walking kind of a, a dangerous line there because uh, uh, could have gotten out of control. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> uh, it reminds me, I was talking to my friend, uh, another certified trainer in Philadelphia, um, and he he said that he was walking on the street um, recently and he noticed that uh, he, he uncovered a part of his awareness that he wasn't um, that wasn't familiar to him, but it got awakened because he realized that there's a part of his brain that's constantly scanning the environment for a handgun. Now, those of you mm. who don't live in the United States, you probably can't relate to this, but um, my friend uh, saw a, a man uh, um, who happened to be um, uh, African American, although that has that only has a tangential part of the story, which we'll get to in just a minute. But uh, and he saw him on the street and he noticed that uh, what appeared to be a handgun in the man's hand. And then uh, at first he he kind of had this reaction come up, this fear. And then uh, because of who he is and his curiosity, he tried to, to find out what was really in the guy's hand. And it turned out to be a cell phone and some other kind of like thing in a leather case. And it just his brain had made the shape of a handgun when it really wasn't there. And then he said his next reaction was that he felt uh, concern for the well-being of the man, that if he confused it as a handgun, 
that maybe he could let the other guy know what had happened uh, so in order to protect him so that other people wouldn't get scared um, or reactive like he did. <clears throat> and so um, he, he took a deep breath and he walked towards the man and he said, hey man, can I, can I tell you what just happened for me? Uh, I'd like to, uh, like to talk to you. And the guy says, sure, yeah, what's going on? And he said, uh, I, I thought I saw a gun and uh, I got really scared and, and, I, and I, I'm really scared for you that somebody might notice that you have a gun and they might respond uh, as if you have a gun and kill you. And the guy says, oh man, I have no idea. Thank you so much for letting me know. And so it's just like your story, Rob, where there's the opportunity for a connection that I don't think I would have done that. I'm so proud of my friend. I think I would have kept walking. It's just because I, I had just have a much meeker, uh, more submissive personality. And so I'm really, I'm really touched uh, about uh, you connecting, Rob. Thank you for sharing the story. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Patricia and then Katie. Um, I, when I'm listening to you, I don't think it's that simple. It's not <laughs> so simple. It's not like four things you can do. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is it depends who, who is the opponent? Who is, who is the person I'm having conflict with? If I'm having conflict with my father, being raised in an authoritarian family, I needed to become mute. Oh. There's no possibility of posturing, fleeing, freezing, or fighting. I relate. But as an adult, I don't have, I'm not confused, but I still have to determine who is the opponent. Yeah. Yeah, you're really and pointing I, out that how critical context is, that we have context. different reactive patterns arise with different peoples in different situations. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. And um, it depends also on um, the culture you're in, you find yourself in now, presently, if it's safe. And if you are going, and, and the safest thing that you, the, the reaction that you're going to have, no matter what, it's to pick the safest thing at this time, right now, as I understand it, yes. and not into an habitual um, pattern. Yes, I, I, I think I, I, the mind I, I, is really important in that decision. Yeah, what you say makes complete sense, and you're actually pointing to the need behind all of these reactive patterns, which is protection and safety. That uh, biologically we uh, we are um, we inherited these reactive patterns to uh, perpetuate our own life and to perpetuate the life of our species. So they have a life-serving function, and the the problem for modern day 21st century human beings is we still um, our brain still thinks that uh, my brain i'll just talk about my brain my brain still thinks that jory is a saber-toothed tiger <laughs> right you know if she if she talks in a particular now i've been married to her for more than 40 years and i know she would never hurt me but if she talks to me in a particular tone of voice <clears throat> i think she's a saber-toothed tiger and I either freeze or run away, or I try to posture. I mean, I have all these words, and again, it's very contextual. That's why we start with a very specific observation, just to expose a little bit about one of our reactive patterns, knowing that any of these could come alive under a different conflict situation. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Patricia. Katie, and then we'll finish this round with Ezra. Yes. I. I... I wanted to say my go-to is to freeze, like numb and shut down. And that's my trauma response. Um, but then there's a whole slew of other um, responses like, like f fleeing and anger. And then I really, and then I get mad at myself for not having any response. And then that is, like a defeatist attitude and then i really want to lash out so it, it's for me it's not like oh it's just one thing it's all of them at different 
for the same situation. It's all of them, but at different times. And it could be a week later that I could have, should have said this and, and defended myself. And yeah, that's all I want to say. That's, that, that's a very, for uh, me, that's a really yeah. clear insight. Go ahead, Joy. Yeah, I was just going to say that's not foreign to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's just part of being human that these things come out and some come out more often than others, but we really have a lot of requisite variety. Yeah. And also like <clears throat> my, my, my question that I asked you to answer was what's the first thing that you notice? And you could explore it with much more depth by doing exactly what you said, uh, Katie. The first thing I noticed was this. And then right after that, I did this. And then after that, I did this. And then I went back to that. And so these, it's almost like our reaction. In fact, this is exactly like the, our initial reaction becomes the observation that we respond to with our next reaction, which becomes the observation for our third reaction and on and on ad infinitum maybe even ad nauseum. And uh, so um, what you say makes perfect sense to me and matches my experience as well. Okay, uh, Ezra, and then we'll really finish with Ellen. I appreciate you guys holding space for us tonight and thank you for letting me speak again. Um, uh, I just wanted to say two things. One, I, I really agree with a lot of the people that talked after me. Um, context does matter a lot. Um, and how we react to situations. And I feel like um, there's this new thing that I'm seeing in the community of survivors, whether that be from spiritual growth or actually surviving a physical or an abusive home. I'm gonna say survivors just to put it in the umbrella term. But what I've seen from survivors that are now kind of like healed in a, in a healing journey is they kind of look down and they say like, well, you should have done this or you should have done that to other survivors. And I noticed that the way that other survivors deal with conflict is now being um, uh, criticized, I guess, in, mm -hmm. in the way of like, you're not doing the right thing or you're, yeah. you should have escaped a long time ago or you should have left him a long time ago and all this other mm. stuff that comes up yeah um, I, the second thing i want to sorry Jeff, go ahead no go ahead okay second thing i wanted to add was um the picture of the cats fighting i actually the the initial reaction when i looked at it wasn't conflict it was more of like oh they're playing and i like that the title is called transforming conflict because we're transforming the meaning behind conflict itself into this could actually be something that could be fun at the end. Like, yes, going through conflict is not fun, but fun at the end in the sense of like, you will either learn something, you'll teach something, someone something, or you're just going to be faced with the same lesson that you've been. Makes sense. Coming, it's been coming up again and again. Yeah, you're really pointing to the transformational potential of conflict, which is where we're gonna go to next. <clears throat> Jory and I, before we were um, involved with nonviolent communication, we became mediators. And um, this was after having a, a retail business for about seven and a half years. And then we, we sold that and kind of retired and, and wanted to uh, do something else. And um, I, I think I'm, I, I might have been the one who motivated the movement into um, mediation because uh, I'm a Libra. And you know, Libras are kind of known as the mediators of the zodiac. And I noticed that I had this this in my in my energy, and I was always trying to make peace. And yet, I was terrified, absolutely terrified, of conflict. Now I'm only a little bit terrified of conflict. I'm still scared of conflict, but now I have much more a much bigger toolbox <clears throat> because of NBC and other things like it. And so I now I understand this transformational potential. And um, so Joy and I started mediating and I, we got really comfortable with conflict. Uh, at one point we were doing, I think maybe four or five mediations a week, <clears throat> mostly barking dogs. You wouldn't believe what people, how people can fight about a barking dog and so forth. But <clears throat> we learned a lot. And then we discovered Marshall and we learned that, uh, you know, everything we learned in, in mediation um, class and uh, the hard knocks of being mediators, all that still made sense, but now we had this additional piece 
of the transformative potential that um, hopefully you'll you'll get today. Uh, so um, let's talk about uh, transformational potential of the, these reactions. And so um, nonviolent communication has this um, each of these four what we call the four components has a transformational potential. So <clears throat> if you think about what what observation means, observation being what's often referred to as the first component <clears throat> of nonviolent communication, we're trying to answer a question. What's actually happening here? What do we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch? Okay, and then the second thing we do in NBC, uh, if we're doing it in a, in a particular order, which we don't necessarily recommend, but it's just the way it's often taught, um, is what feelings are arising? <clears throat> you might notice the feelings that are arising in you, like the urge we talked about a few minutes ago when conflict occurs. That's, that, that's a feeling, that urge to run or that urge to freeze or the urge to fight. Those are feelings. And beginning to become aware of those as they arise can really support transformation. And then the, the key question that NBC uh, is, is exquisitely designed to answer is who needs what right now? And that points us to needs and values. And then the fourth one is what might help? So believe it or not, these are related to those four reactive patterns. So freeze. If you're a freezer or you notice yourself freezing in a particular moment, well, notice that. You transform what you're actually doing into the awareness of what you're actually doing. And now you're no longer frozen. Instead, you're observing, you're freeze. That, that's like a, um, a quantum leap towards uh, liberation. Second, if you notice the urge is to flee, then take a step back from the situation, but just one step instead of a hundred steps or a hundred days or whatever, uh, whatever it is, you just take one step back so that you can gain a little bit more clarity about um, what's actually happening. What's going on in my body? What am I feeling? Maybe even making a guess about what my partner in the conflict is feeling. So we do that by stepping back. And then the third transformation is to transform posturing into curiosity. So usually when we posture, we get in somebody's face, but instead of getting into somebody's face, we've already taken a step back. And so from this new position of taking a step back, now we can lean in with wonder and curiosity. Who needs what right now? And then we can transform that energy of fighting into making a request. What might help? Okay. So we're going to actually practice this as a, a, a dance in just a second, but let me just show it again as, a, as the four components of NBC and relate it now to these 28 skills that we've been working on since October. First, we're, uh, we're awakening the skill of observing. Secondly, we're awakening the skill of feelings awareness. Third, we're getting curious about needs. This is actually a radical idea that completely transformed my understanding of conflict. Didn't make the conflict go away, but it helped me to understand why I was in them. And the fourth is it gave, us, gave me a way out. What might make more life more wonderful? As Marshall said, conflict's not so wonderful most of the time, although we can enjoy conflict, like a good game of cards or um, some other kind of competitive activity. But uh, what might make life wonderful right here in the midst of conflict? And so uh, we're gonna learn a little bit of a dance. And so let's put this slide back up. Um, this one, where is it? I have to find it here. So <clears throat> bring to mind your, your conflict again, the one that you started with and your observation. Just allow it to come closer to your experience. 
and then just notice that a conflict has emerged and just describe it to yourself. You stand your ground for one second or a microsecond and notice that a conflict is emerging. And then imagine that you take a step back. That could be leaning back in your chair. It could be literally taking a step back. This actually uh, turns on the prefrontal vortex of your brain. And it awakens um, the, what's called the executive function of your brain just by having just a little bit of perspective. And if one step is not enough, Take two steps back. You, you decide how many steps back you need to take, but you're doing it with consciousness. <clears throat> and that's awakening your capacity to be aware of your feelings and maybe even to get curious about the feelings of the other person. And then the third step in the dance is just to lean forward and in some cultures, it really works to put your chin, uh, your hand on your chin as part of the dance. You've probably seen that famous uh, Rodin sculptor called The Thinker. And this actually uh, is often a trigger for curiosity. Hmm. You notice people in the conversation sometimes in the coffee shop and they're, hmm, maybe even tilt your head a little bit. Hmm. So that's leaning in with curiosity. And the question in your mind is who needs what right now? And then you decide, is this a safe place where maybe I can make a request? And if so, then you take one step forward towards the conflict. If not, then you can repeat the other steps again. So if, you, if you're willing, you could actually stand up and I'll, I'll guide you through the, the steps. Get off your tushies a little bit. <clears throat> and imagine that the conflict, <clears throat> make sure that there's a one step behind you so you won't run into your chair. And imagine that the conflict emerges in your imagination. Stand your ground for a second, noticing. Take one step back. Lean in. Assess safety and step forward. We'll do it again. Notice the conflict emerging. Take one step back. Lean in, assess for safety, and if you choose to, take one step forward towards the conflict. And then we'll speed it up just a little bit. Conflict emerges, take a step back, get curious, lean forward, step forward. Conflict emerges, take a step back, Get curious, lean forward, take a step forward. One more time, conflict emerges, take a step back, get curious, take a step forward. And do it on your own. So now we'll go yeah, back to small that, groups. Yeah. Go ahead, just, just for you to know, you, if you can do this exercise with actually the instructions of each of those steps over and over, it becomes habituated in your being. It yeah. becomes more natural. So it's a perfect thing to continue to practice and get really clear on those four steps because you can do, if you get really practiced in it, you can do it without anyone even noticing, just the slightest bit of coming back and then the 
slightest bit of curiosity and then the choice do i want to move forward or do i want to move back yeah so jory go ahead and make the groups for 13 minutes okay i wanted i want to check if there are some language groups here that i'm missing if you have a particular language that you would prefer to be in and um just put what that language is. And if I see other people who have that language, I'll move you around and put you together. So we'll do this for 13 minutes. And the idea here, this time I remember to tell you what to do. Talk about, <laughs> what, this, talk about what this experience is like for you. Did you, when you do it, when you did it, did it make a difference? Did you notice how it changed anything about your relationship to the conflict? Uh, does this make any sense? Do you think it's dumb? Whatever is alive in you, you get to express. You'll everybody have about five minutes to talk about what it's like for you. And the other people are empathizing. They're just listening to you in silence and, and just being present with you. It's a chance to just practice the listening part of NBC. And then you go to the next person and they express and the other two people listen. What's it, what was it like for you to try this exercise and so forth? So everybody gets a chance to have about four or five minutes and then we'll come back and do the final process of the day. And um, so again, uh, if you don't wanna be in a group, by the way, you can put an equal sign in front of your name. And we have a special uh, place where we, uh, uh, we make, make a group there where you, you can just be, um, um, and yes, I will put the slides up again, uh, especially at the end, we'll keep them up at the very end so you can write some notes. I've got some. Are they visible during? Are they visible if, if they're in the breakout rooms? That might um, be helpful. I've gotten yeah. mixed feedback about that. That some people find it really distracting to have them. So we'll put them up at okay. the end. All righty. Okay. See you guys in fifteen minutes. All righty. Mm -hmm. Oh, is he ready to start? Yeah. Welcome back. Jory, you always get us at the time where the conversation just gets so good and we're about to like hit a high point. I know, we come back. I know. That's why we have that's why we have the after party, right? Press the button, by the way. It happens automatically. You're gonna have to find someone else to blame. <laughs> it's it's my fault. It's my fault. That's my it's always Jim's fault. That's the secret to a happy marriage for me, is it's always my yeah, really. fault. You gotta be kidding. <laughs> yeah. And so um, we have about 15 minutes left and then we'll do an after party. So we'll put you right back into your group if you'd like, so you can finish your conversation. I know it's terribly disruptive when we come back. Go ahead, Siva. Uh, I want you to remind me of what has become my favorite saying, uh, I don't know, I guess Marshall said it. Um, if I knew if I then, then what I'm learning now, I would do it differently. So it actually starts with, it will, I thought, no, that's how it ends. Yeah. Oh, and it'll always be this way. How does it start, Jim? You yeah, remember? it starts with, um, you have never done anything wrong. Right, right, right. You never have. And you never, never will. will. You may have done some things yes. that if uh, if you if you knew then you knew what you're then, learning now, you're learning now, you might you have made a different differently. choice. Yeah, and it'll yeah. always be that way. It's yeah. that piece that it'll always be that way for me makes so much more spaciousness instead of I have to change it. No, this is what it means to be a human being. It just is this way. And now I can just make that space around it. Yeah. Thanks for asking, Sheila. See and you. before we go to Rena and Tanya, I, I wanna fulfill the promise that I made to put these screens back up. By the way, you're free to uh, make um, screenshots of these if it's helpful, rather than write it down. If you don't know how to do that, then you can look it up in, uh, for your computer. But, um, so uh, this was a little sequence that we just did. We started about transforming these reactive patterns into life-serving responses. And then we related them to the, five, to the four components of nonviolent communication. What 
actually happen, the observation without evaluation, just what did I see or hear, taste, touch, smell? That simple. What's actually happening? And then, go ahead, Jim. And Love then the feelings, of course, and the needs and so forth. And then we talked about how we could use these uh, four components of MVC to transform our reactive patterns. Freeze transforms to noticing, flight to stepping back, posturing to leaning in, getting curious, fight to stepping forward and making a request. That goes back to those uh, four skills, observing, feelings, awareness, needs, consciousness, and request consciousness. You put it all together in a package. And it looks like that. And Jim, do you mind going back one? Going back one, sure. Observation. Can you go back again? Actually, two. I, two. One more. One more. One more. Ah. That was two, I think you just. Yeah, that's in. perfect. Uh, that's what. Okay, that's okay. Can you now, go back way, again, please? These four questions came up for me about, I don't know, maybe it's about eight years now ago now when somebody wanted me to explain NBC in 20 words or less. So that's where I came up with these questions. One, two, three. And, and they're really straightforward, the four different components. What's actually happening? Observation, feelings. What, what's the feeling? Um, the needs that are there. What, what is actually the deeper need that's motivated here? Observation, feeling, needs, and then request. What's my request of myself? What might help? Yeah, there are those transformations. And um, then this is the places where we can practice that we started with at the very beginning of the call. So you take what you learned here and then you figure out, you can, now that, that this is what, this is, relates to that last question, what might help? And these are the three choices that we have in NBC. It, you know, it's, it's so, so easy in a way to be in NBC because somebody says, well, what do I do if such and such happens? Well. You have these three choices. You can either connect with yourself, express your honesty, or uh, go to empathy for the other person's experience. And just for clarity, self-connection actually is probably the most important piece to make sure you are at least grounded before you do either of the other two. And here's the dance steps again. Notice, step back. Lean in, step forward. And again, for those who came late, that step back is not necessarily a true physical, I, I, I put one foot behind me and step back. It's an internal stepping back. You tune into what's going on inside of you and the other person probably won't notice. They don't actually notice what you're doing. You're still standing there as far as they're concerned, but you are basically putting that attention into yourself. You notice, you let the whatever's happening in front of you, let go, you let go of it. And when you're ready, you ba open back up, you lean in. And then the stepping forward is the action that, or the, the voice, the words you want to use in that moment that you have gleaned from all of this that might make life more wonderful in that moment. Okay. And with that, I see that there's a couple, some hands up first with Rena. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my takeaway from today is my deeper understanding of my fight response because, you know, I, I used to use that and I, I just realized today that, you know, earlier it was from a moralistic judgment and I need to show up. I have this action energy 
So I would fight for fairness, for justice, for, you know, what I feel is right, my opinion. And from there, it moved to righteous anger or, you know, means, I mean, when I'm in mean, there's righteous kind of energy. So again, the key, key differentiations are very helpful along with these processes that you are bringing to us. And uh, today I realized that with the zero step, my, I was like scared that my fight energy is gone. But actually I see in a subtle way that my zero step is helping me to, to come together with that, that sense of needs, consciousness to step in, to step forward with uh, possible action, you know, or movement in that, in any situation. So I'm really celebrating that my fighting spirit has transformed to a connecting spirit and showing up in the world uh, where I can use NVC for social change and mediation. So, oh, yeah. Wonderful. Hey. Yeah, thank you, Rina. Thanks for the partnership. And uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to defer to, to uh, Ellen. OK, we can come back to you in a moment. I, I just um, I was I wasn't couldn't write fast enough. Freeze transforms to noticing. What was the fourth one? I've got posturing is to leaning in. And what was the last of the four steps? Um, moving to. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Joy. Stepping into the situation. Stepping, Stepping forward. forward. So that's related to freeze, flight, posturing, and... And fight. Fight's the last one. Fight. fight. You're transforming fight into a request. Okay. Mm -hmm. And into that. action. You're actually something that you can actually contribute. Yeah, right. Contribute, you're listening, contribute, you know, you can have an invitation or you can express your honesty. Empathy or honesty basically are the two parts. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Thank you for asking. And Faye? I wonder if you could put that one slide up there. It was only, it was, it was only up there for a short period of time. It was that Transport, I think it was kind of a circular one. I only got a brief glance at it. No, not that one. Circular one, Jim. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just go through them again. You tell me when to stop. One. <laughs> nope, not that one. Two. Nope. Three. Nope. Four. No, there was another one. Damn, <laughs> A circular yes, one. Oh, that's there it. Go. There you go. Thank you. And while you look at that, I see some more hands up. Uh, Shizuki? Shizuka? Thank you. Uh, I had a question. Before stepping in, stepping forward, um, if if it was just if the conflict is not the safe place, uh, are, are we allow us to step forward in it? Well, oh, actually, I love that you asked that question because really what it is, is you step in the direction that you sense is the safest, most need meeting way. Thank you for clarifying and bringing that forth because that's a really important piece. You're taking a step. Um, you're taking a step toward meeting more needs at less cost. And that doesn't necessarily mean stepping toward the person. You step toward life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Could I add to that, Joy? Yeah. I guess you can. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm also doing my skincare. But uh, I was also just going to add, like, I think part of like when we hear conflict it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be resolved the way that it started or like with the person that it started it could also just resolve with you walking away from that situation 
Absolutely. I, I think, and it's up to you to decide when walking away is necessary and all right. Like if you walk away and you feel like your boundary has been crossed, <clears throat> there's definitely ways to go around that to make sure maybe it doesn't cross again or maybe it doesn't cross with that person again. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we need to just take conflict as just a neutral term of something arose in, a, in our environment or in our daily living that isn't part of our usual thing. And it's making us uh, respond in a way that we need to. Thank you. Or like, yeah, thank yeah. you so much for clarifying that because it's so important we realize that that take a step forward part of this process is not necessarily meaning that you step toward the other person. Yeah. You step forward toward life. What will meet the most needs and you move in that direction. So you move past the anger part, you move past the frozen part, you move past all the should parts in there, in the right wrong game, and what will meet the most needs at the least cost to others. And that's where, you're, where you step. Yeah. And before we go to Ayako, I want to do our, our end of the call um, little things. Can you wait for just a moment, Ayako? Does that work? Okay. So. There's a way to join our mail list. So this is a new link that we haven't been adding before, but you can copy that link out of the chat or click directly on it and join our mail list. If you want to make sure you get notified of uh, this class, what we're gonna do each week and so forth. That's for people who aren't already on the list. And you can also make a copy of it if you know somebody else who would like to join us and you can share it. And then uh, it, at the end of uh, the class, and when I finish uh, processing the recording, I will eventually get it posted on YouTube and to uh, our website, pathwaystoliberation.com <clears throat> slash resources. Jim, are you saying we're now posting it publicly on YouTube? No, I'm, uh, yes, I didn't think yes, so. yes, there is a yeah. YouTube channel there is a YouTube channel for these classes. That's true. Ah, that's okay. And people can subscribe to it and they, you know, there's only like 50 people in there, probably the 50 people who are here today. And um, then uh, some people uh, know about my book, probably you all do, but uh, just in case you don't, I did write a book uh, last year and you can buy it anywhere that books are sold including uh, you can get free shipping. You can get some links at internationalshopping.com. They have, uh, there's a bunch of links there where how you can order the book for uh, free shipping. And finally, um, we do all of our work with nonviolent communication on a compassionate giving and receiving basis. And so uh, we invite you to give directly to the Center for Nonviolent Communication with the second link there. For some reason, ours is on there twice. Um, and um, that, that if you're a US citizen, that might be tax deductible for you. You can check with your own tax professional to find out about that. Because <clears throat> uh, CNBC. Yeah, you make it a donation and you can make it in your name or our name. And CNBC is a tax deductible, a tax exempt organization, but check with your own tax account and we can't give any tax advice. And um, we can barely do our own taxes these days. And then uh, if you want to give directly to us, you can give it to us on PayPal at that uh, last link. And then we make sure it goes to a uh, NBC based project. Okay, so that's all the commercials and now it's 530. I'm going to leave the recording on because I have a sense that uh, Ayako's question might matter. So go ahead, Ayako. And after she's done, by the way, we'll open up groups and I'll make sure that the groups have at least two or three people in them. You'll end up back where you were, or if you stay here, we'll put you in a different one. Or if your other people have left, um, I'll move you around too. Okay. Go ahead. Ayako? Ayako? 
Okay, thank you for your time. Um, there's a, uh, when there, there's a conflict, oftentimes I'm the only one who feel this is a conflict and other, the other doesn't realize there's a conflict. That's- That's astonishing, and, huh? And yeah, and, um, yeah but the, the, the jury mentioned about the things about the step forward, not to the other person, but to the life explains what I just said, I feel. So I don't really need a answer, but I just felt that way. Thank you. Yes, thank you for asking. It, it reminds me of something that I was just shocked to learn. Some of you might have heard of the, uh, the uh, researcher and therapist named John Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. And Gottman has done a lot of research on couples and uh, I learned from his from reading his work that some couples never process their conflicts and they live happily ever after. This was absolutely completely astonishing for me because Jory and I uh, process a lot of conflicts. And, um, you know, it just seems like an important part of our particular relationship path, but it's not for everybody. And so everybody finds their own particular style for uh, working with conflict. And there's no right or wrong ways. It's just whatever serves life for a particular uh, partnership, whether it's a romantic partnership or a work partnership and so forth. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, Siva, go ahead. Um, I thought that was such an interesting question. And, and coincidentally, or I don't know, it's probably not coincidentally, but my husband and I have a Gottman trained uh, marriage counselor that we see once a week through Zoom. What? Um, and, uh, and, but I think the dynamic that uh, Ayako is, is feeling is that according to another psychiatrist by the name of William Glasser, he identifies five needs. And one of those needs is feeling like you belong and that you are loved. So the, the need to belong is so, so strong that uh, obviously you're, Ayako, you are here, your friends are not here. So such a, a, a dominance of needing to feel like you belong that people will just not even notice that there's a conflict between who they are. And, 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 and that's, that, that's another struggle is who am I? Who, who, who am I really? You know, that's a, that's a lifelong journey. Who am I? Because you do have a sort of a, an identity, but it, it matures, it grows, it grows, it grows, and then you die. Life is a journey. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering if that's part of the dynamics yeah. of- I, Yeah, I wanna just check with people because they may wanna go into the breakout rooms. So we have two more people who want to comment. Um, and what I can do is open up the breakout groups if you would like to so speak up and let me know if that's true. And you, then you get choice of when you go. And, and before we do any of that, I just want to say next week, we're going to continue the journey of transforming conflict. And I'm going to turn the recording off now. And thank you all for coming and all of your support and everything, everything you does matter, matters to bringing peace to the world. So thank you, thank you for your contributions and thank you for your partnership, Jory. Yeah. Thank you, Jim, for yours.